Okay, I want to introduce our introducer, Dick Boulay, who I just happened to end up at his table once as a uh, student, um, and he was a student. We were co-students. We were co-students at the same table in T-38s. Well, he started 38s, and then I kind of jumped on his table in the middle of <laughs> So I'll let uh, Dick's a pretty good friend. I got to know him pretty well, and I'll let him introduce Oli since he knows him a lot better than I. Thank you, Art. About four years ago, someone invited me to a meeting of the American Aviation Historical Society. i have heard of it before, but I really didn't know what it was. So I, uh, I understood that it had been founded by Jimmy Doolittle, so I thought it must be good. So I showed up to the meeting, and I wasn't quite sure if this was the proper room at the Summit Trans Pack Academy at Deer Valley Airport. And I was looking a little bit lost, and there was a guy standing at the door, and he said, do you love airplanes? And I said, yes. And he says, well, come on in. You're welcome. And that was this guy right next to me, who is Ole Curtis Griffith. So uh, some places you'll see him referred to as Ole, some places as Curtis. Depends on whether uh, your family or friends or whatever. But um, Ole kept inviting me to come over to his museum. It was his apartment. It was actually two apartments at the Beatitudes. And when I finally went, I realized he wasn't kidding about uh, it being a museum. The first time I was there, I showed up at 10 o'clock in the morning. And at midnight, I was telling Oli, I have to leave. I have to, I have to stay awake driving home. And Oli was still raring to go. He could have, I, I don't know how much longer he could have gone, but um, it was incredible. Anyway, uh, without further ado, uh, let me turn it over to my good friend Oli Griffith. Any good day? Did you hear me? Yep, oh, sir. Yes, sir. What I was going to say was, Oli promised to keep this presentation to under 14 hours. <laughs> <laughs> I will certainly try. I, I learned a good lesson the first time I went to dining in in the Pentagon. We had a presentation by the then current Chief of Staff of the Air Force. Fabulous presentation. 20 minutes right on the nose. Everybody applauded and had a few drinks, exchanged a few greetings, and we thought, boy, what next? <laughs> next was the head of the Federal Aviation Agency. Mm. Don't remember his name, but he came in lugging two gigantic books. He said, I really didn't have time to prepare a speech, so I will read to you from the congressional record. <laughs> I said, boy, we are really going to hear the poop now. We heard two and a half hours of poop from the congressional record. <laughs> Here are generals and colonels. I think we were headed by a three-star general at that time. And by the time the meeting was over, half the generals were asleep. The rest of us were playing cards or playing spit of the bottle. And we figured we'd all be out picking up cigarette butts the next day. But uh, the general was pretty kind about it. And he just said, we'll make damn sure from now on that the speaker knows that the limit is 20 minutes. <laughs> the next guy that shows up was Milt Kniff. Anybody not know Milt Kniff? Terry and the Pirates and so on. Well, he started talking with a huge placard on the wall, and he starts drawing sketches. Just as fast as he could talk, he was drawing sketches and tearing them off and throwing them on the floor. So I called his aide the next morning. I said, hey, Bill, how about picking up one of those things for me? He said, Sonny Boy, the 57 generals in line ahead of you to get those things. <laughs> so anyway, I don't have a congressional record, but uh, did you something the name of the... The name of my collection of photos? I didn't. The pictures that we're going to be showing you are all from Baby Boy's scrapbook. Now, my lady friend found my original birth certificate, which depicts my name as Baby Boy. So she said, why don't we call this Baby Boy's scrapbook? Well, that has grown from early days, 
by the many friends that the Lord has given me to know, many experiences that I've had to where I have thousands and thousands of pictures and photographs and letters and so on, and I still call it Baby Boy Scrapbook. So, on with Baby Boy Scrapbook. Uh, the beginning show is the cockpit of B-25. Go back one. Uh, how many B-25 pilots are in here? <laughs> How's your hearing? Not worth a damn, huh? Oh, no. My hearing aids are on hold on, that's going to help me. Uh, okay, this, this is a B-25, and it's typical of the ones that I flew, and a couple of unique features about this airplane that I don't think you'll find in many other airplanes. If you look at the radio compass, right up on top, is calibrated in one degree increments. And on the wheel, this one, the steering wheel, there was a little button marked torpedo release. It was the only B-25 that I ever saw then. Actually, we call that an F-10, F for photo in those days. So we'll come back to that later on. Now, later on, we were talking about how we got our start in aviation. I got my start in aviation when I was four years old, maybe five. We were living in Kentucky, and a guy who had been a Navy pilot in World War I built a little factory in Owensboro, Kentucky, and he was building the sixth airplane that he'd been delivered, that he'd been ordered. It was called the Kentucky Cardinal. So I was arrested one day at the age of four and a half, driving my tricycle down the main street of Owensboro, Kentucky, and I was arrested. He said, you're the preacher's kid, aren't you? I said, yes, sir. What are you doing downtown? going down to see the airplane. He said, son, there's no airplanes down here. I said, yes, there is one down here. Where? Down in the Ford Agency. He said, let me take you home to Daddy. He said, Robert, your son says there's an airplane down here. Well, there is. So Dad took me down there, and sure enough, the Kentucky Cardinal was there. And he introduced me to the pilot. The pilot showed me this beautiful airplane. He didn't let me sit in the cockpit. There were two great big dials of instruments of some sort. There was a stick there. And when I moved that stick forward and backward and sideways, I could things out of the tail of the wings that moved up and down. So those were used for steering the airplane. So I was absolutely fascinated. I was, you know, I played with electric trains, and then I learned all about electricity with my electric trains and building things for Dad. Dad only had one arm. He was a preacher. He lost his right arm when he was a kid. So, uh, anyway, uh, the pilot told us, he said, tomorrow I'm going to fly over your house, and I'm going to jazz my engine, and I'm going to wave to you. So Dad and I were sitting out on the porch, and this was Valentine's Day in 1927. So that means, what, February 1927. I'm still five years old. And uh, this beautiful red airplane came over, he goosed his engine a little bit, he waved to us, something fell off the airplane. I said, that's a candy drop. You know, they dropped bars of candy on a parachute, and we drove around and picked up. No, it was the lower right wing of the airplane. <laughs> about that time, the upper wing pulled it back, and the airplane did several unpensionable maneuvers, crashed and exploded in the backyard of my home. So here's a picture of the crash. I found this out years later, as I've been back to Owensboro, uh, visiting my brother, who was now a pastor of the same church that Dad had pastored in 1927. And I went to the library, and the librarian said, I remember that. So I waited five minutes, and she came back with this, cool, with this picture here. This is the guy's name, Sheehan. He was the next Navy pilot. He built this airplane. And I think it was the sixth or seventh plane that he had delivered. <clears throat> and it crashed. He told me that he was going to get married the night before he flew. And his wife came out to the airport and she wanted to fly with him. He said, no, it's too dangerous. You watch me fly. So he took off with a parachute and went through that crash. And there was the scene of the crash. Years later, in visiting there with my brother, I found a dentist in town who remembered the incident. And he said he took pictures of the crash. And here is a picture of the crash. As you can see, there wasn't much left of the airplane. And I, I was horrified, just absolutely distraught. But here's the pilot laying out in the street. 
the police are there picking him up. And I said, Dad, is the man hurt? He said, yes, he's, he's very, bad, very badly hurt. And I said, what are they going to do with him? He said, well, they'll put him in a box and bury him in the ground. I said, well, he can back to work like uh, back to earth like Jesus did. No, but said, that's another story. We'll talk about that tonight. <laughs> so I went home with my kid sister, who's now only 95, and uh, boy, we were scared to death. We wouldn't go to the bathroom without one of our parents being there. But anyway, lo and behold, we're playing airplane. And by this time, I learned a little bit about Lindbergh. He landed in Paris on my sixth birthday. And that wiped out all fear. Boy, to me, that was the end of the world. All I needed to do was fly. And it's just like the meteor. So here we are with an airplane. And uh, there was a bicycle ladder. And there was my spirit of St. Louis. Now, I was pretty careful. I was a careful kid. And I knew that the spirit of St. Louis had a periscope on it. So on this airplane, you can see a periscope there. They had a center box. So I was going to. Okay, they that. The, 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 wing, the uh, airfoil of the wing there was pretty flat. I think it was the board. And there's a bicycle in there. And so anyway, that's the millionaire Art Lindbergh. <laughs> uh, now, speaking of Lindbergh, as most of you probably know, right after he flew to Paris, he flew the Spirit of St. Louis around to all 48 states. It was a goodwill gesture. We were visiting my grandparents in Kansas when he came into Kansas City. So Dad drove my sister and me and my mother down to Kansas City, and Mother took a picture of the Spirit of St. Louis with a little box camera. I got up on Dad's shoulders, and I took this picture. It's never been published, but this was as close as I could get to Lindbergh. So did you ever meet Lindbergh? Yeah, yes. Yeah. I was close enough to take his picture. I think of the original nigga, he was a 16th of an inch high. But anyway, that was my first meeting with Lindbergh. I had two more encounters with Lindbergh, which I'll tell you about later on. Now, as I said, Dad was a preacher, and I started to collect these photographs. One of the best photographs I had, and I think this guy's a bit I know he's a bit Yeah, I know he's a bit dead. Yeah, dead the dead end. The dead end. The dead end. <laughs> the dead end, I was going to say. Uh, his name was Ernest Udet. Ernest Udet was the top scoring Luftwaffe ace in World War I. Yeah. He took over from Rochelle and he became an American citizen. And he is, if there are any other QBs here, you'll know that he is a QB. I'm pretty sure he's a dead end. But, um, Anyway, explain what QB is. Pardon? Explain what QB is. QB is quiet Birdman, which is the biggest misnomer in the world. <laughs> when I first came in here, it has another QB meeting. I could hear everybody in the room with my, ear, with my old hearing aids. But anyway, uh, I told you Dad was a preacher, and uh, I was criticized very often for not paying attention. So many times I didn't have pictures of an airplane, and my friend Doug Corrigan. You know, took off from New York to fly to California. Yeah. After a while, he crossed strange land. He said, where the hell are the maps of Ireland? Wrong way, Corrigan. Uh, he claimed that, that he'd been turned down for making that flight because the Curtis Robin was not fit to fly. So he claimed that he'd taken off from Los Angeles and his compass went out of commission. So that's why he landed in Ireland. But anyway, I, I sketched this thing from a Reader's Digest of my uh, Literary Digest paper did in church. Dad always said, son, you should be listening to me preach, not drawing airplane pictures. So anyway, I sent this to him to get his autograph. And that was the beginning of the transition of my collection from uh, Baby Boy Scrapbook to autograph pictures of aviators. So I have hundreds of pictures now, just about anybody you can think of in the aviation world, where I send the pictures, very kindly they'd autograph. One of the ones that I love most is from Major General Westover. He said, Major General Air Corps, Commander Chief of the U.S. Air Corps. And he killed himself, went into San Diego one time in a consolidated TV2A. But uh, anyway, that collection went on, and just about anybody you could think of, Donald Douglas, uh, uh, 
anybody else you can think of, I have their autograph picture. I don't think Dixie would seen all of them. But uh, we can come back later. One of the hazards of a <clears throat> bad ejection I got at Trainer at Whitefield, <clears throat> they uh, gave us a very complicated course, very thorough course on how to use the ejection seat. You know, how to position our bodies, make sure that we really had a need to eject. And they put a charge into it to shoot you up to the right height. As they come at it afterwards, <clears throat> somebody put a general officer's charge in there because I hit the stop and it shortened me by about two inches. <laughs> and one of these things is the reason I can't reach them. I used to be able to salute with one hand, but now it takes two. <clears throat> there is one of my favorite pictures when I was a kid. This was a picture that appeared in the newspaper uh, in 1927, 1929. And it had various headings on it, but one of them was the world's three greatest aviators. Well, it doesn't take long to know that there's Charles Lindbergh in there and there's Jimmy Doolittle. But who the hell is the third guy? It mentions Lieutenant Al Williams, the world-known speed flyer. I'll talk more about him later because he became my godfather by his own choice. But we'll talk about him a little bit later. There is a picture of Al Williams uh, that his wife, or his widow chose, oh, his wife chose. <coughs> At the time, uh, he won the Pulitzer race. That was one of the very early races yeah. that was observed by almost all famous aviators who encouraged them to go into air racing. Jimmy Doolittle, Doolittle was one of them. But anyway, he won the Pulitzer Prize. He went on immediately after that to set the world speed record, which was over 300 miles an hour. And everybody warned him that 250 miles an hour was the absolute maximum that the human body could stand. Yeah. But he had something like 325. Uh, here's a picture of Al. He misspelled my name because this was a Curtis airplane. He had to do it a second S on the tail end of my name. But the way I got to meet him was he has formed an organization with a Scripps Hour newspapers called the Junior Aviators. That was open to boys and girls up to about 16 years of age. And he was in the Pittsburgh press. <coughs> And everybody knew at that time, or Captain, Lieutenant Al Williams. So Dad was a friend of all the ministers in town, and this one Catholic priest said, Al Williams belongs to my church. Would you like to meet him? So anyways, through my dad, we got to meet Al Williams. He invited us up to his office in the top floor of the Gulf building. This was the Gulf Oil Company, which among other things, sponsored all kinds of flights from anybody to go to Florida for the All-American Air Maneuvers. And he paid the way. All you needed was own an airplane or have access to an airplane, and you could get all of the Gulf oil and lubrication products that you needed. He started naming his airplanes Gulf Hawk. Because there was a, wind, a bird called the Gulf Hawk, and Al became so fascinated with the Gulf airplanes, he became ultimately the aviation manager for the Gulf Oil Company in charge of all their research and development. And we'll have more about that later. But uh, let's see, our next picture, I got associated with the junior aviators. And the way we were organized, each small individual group was called a squadron. And then if you had several squadrons together, you became a group commander. And I ultimately became a group commander under Al Williams, the chief of the junior aviators. I think we had 380,000 members before the war ended. Probably 300,000 of us wound up fighting in the war. Air Force, Marine Corps, Navy. Um, here, I had a, an opportunity to set up a model airplane department. My flight, or my squadron at that time, had set up a display of model airplanes. So we had the hangars laid out, we had runways for strips of paper, and we had model airplanes on it. And uh, then we decided that we'd see if there was some store in town where we could display this. So there was, was a, 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 is my voice coming through okay? Mm -hmm. There was a uh, hardware store called Nell's Hardware. And he had a great big plate glass front. And I showed him the pictures that appeared in the newspaper. And I said, could we, dis could we display this in your shop? Sure. So we put it on display. The place was flooded, absolutely flooded with kids. They all want to know, where do you get those airplanes? So I explained to the owner of the store that when you buy the kits, 
and you assemble them and you make the airplanes. He said, could you set up a department here? So I did. I set up a model airplane department that eventually became the biggest model department in Pittsburgh. And I sponsored a contest one time, and I called my now good friend, Al Williams, and asked him if he would judge the contest. Judge the contest. So there he is with a boyfriend of mine and I, and Al is judging the contest. Well, this just brought in a lot of people to the hardware store, but it also brought a humongous, a humongous increase in the number of junior aviators. And later on, I was making a speech up at Oshkosh, and I mentioned junior aviators, and the, the place exploded with applause. So there were a lot of junior aviators around. Okay. Now, Al Williams called me one time, said, next time you're in town, could you drop by and see me? I said, my God, why would Al Williams want to see me? So I went in and he had a model of his Grumman Gulfhawk. Now his first one was the Curtis Gulfhawk, just the old Curtis Hawk, the original Curtis Hawk. So this was his two-seat Grumman Gulfhawk with a retractable gear, and it was smashed to bits. He says, can you fix it? And I guess with more balls and braids, I said, yes, sir, I can fix it. But I'll have back the time getting the orange paint regular bell orange. Now here again was a little bit of psychology. He didn't say I'll get it for you. He said, here's my card. And he wrote on the back of it, give Curtis whatever he needs. He said, go out to the airport and Frank, Frank Ty, my mechanic, and he'll give you whatever you need. So he gave me a gallon of this beautiful gulf orange paint. And I painted the airplane up for after the straight of a shop. Now this was a plywood, I mean a balsa wood, tissue covered airplane, about a 36 inch diameter, or a wingspan. So I brought it back to him, and he was elated. After the discussion, he said, what can I do for you? And I said, well, sir, I have this collection of pictures, and uh, I've been a lover of Oral Ray for many years. Is there any way I can get an autographed picture of Oral Ray? He said, sure, come back and see me in a week. Well, a week later, I went back to him, he gave me an envelope, there was an 8x10 picture, Oral Wright autographed by him. Two smaller pictures also autographed. And I said, how did you do that? He said, well, Charles Lindbergh and I have both been fighting to get the original Wright airplane back to this country. They had, they had loaned the airplane to England. It was on display in the, in the British World's Fair. Then World War II came along, and they hid it in a Welsh coal mine for protection. Now the war is over. In the meantime, the Smithsonian taken the Pierpont Langley machine, which made two abortive attempts to fly by being launched from boat on the Potomac River, and they both plunged in and sank. However, Langley was the main superintendent at the Smithsonian at that time. So they decided to display that plane, and it was identified as the first machine capable of human flight. Well, this got Rowe pretty pissed off. He didn't like that at all. So Lindbergh and Charles Lindbergh, I mean, Al Williams and Charles Lindbergh, were pushing like mad to bring that airplane back to this country. They also went to work on Sam Garber, who now took over as the head of Smithsonian's aviation, or youth reason, aviation division, and convinced him that that airplane ought to be back in the United States. He said it should. So then, Negotiations started. They had to work with Orville Ray because they had to get rid of this crazy <coughs> Langley machine. So apparently Wright agreed with the new head of Smithsonian that if they could get the airplane back and put it on display, they would take the Pierpont machine, the Langley machine, off display. It's off display. They could also say that we will put the Wright airplane in whatever condition it is, on display in Smithsonian, and or will write, may dictate the wording that goes on the airplane. So the way it reads now is something like, this is the, air, the first airplane that was designed, built, and flown by the Wright brothers, Wilbur and Orville. The exact words that Orville Wright quoted. Now here's this plane flying in England, because after the last flight, on the day of the first flight, they stopped for coffee. A gust of wind took the original airplane, flipped it up, 
and smashed it pretty badly. So it was really a pile of sweat, aluminum and wood, maybe some iron, and an engine. So Oracle Wright agreed to go over and supervise the rebuilding of this airplane. Now, according to all the information I've gotten, there were many pieces that were missing, and some were broken. And the Oracle Wright himself fabricated those pieces from memory. The airplane was shipped back to the United States. Sam Garber, who's now the head of development at the Smithsonian, went down and met the ship where the airplane in boxes was received. He followed it right down to the Smithsonian uh, when they were put on display. Now, a side issue, Garber, in Garber's biography, he says, before we opened it to the public, I crawled up on the wing and assumed the position that Orville took when he was flying, lying on his belly. Some little girl looked up and said, Daddy, look at that monkey crawling around in there. <laughs> he said, I've been called everything now, I'm called a monkey. But uh, anyway, that's the way it is now. But it, it was earlier, the spirit of St. Louis was located in the Smithsonian in the number one position. Now the question is, they've got the right brothers plane. So they're with the Lindbergh to discuss how they should position the airplanes. He said, by all means, put the right flyer ahead of the spirit of St. Louis. So that's the way you are, are now. You're with the Smithsonian, you see the right plane with the spirit of St. Louis behind it. Another monumental decision by Lindbergh. Okay, there, there is the original Gulf Hawk. That's on display in the Smithsonian now. And it displays the, uh, the beautiful color scheme that they all use. That's Gulf Orange, that's Gulf Hawk 2, Gulf Hawk 2. Gulf Hawk 2. There's Gulf Hawk 4. Where was Gulf Hawk 3? Gulf Hawk 3 was a two-seat version of Gulf Hawk 2. And it was used for administrative purposes. I don't think Al ever put on a demonstration with it, but it was used for administrative purposes. So then the... The next one that came along was Gulf Hawk 4. Now, Al Williams had an unfortunate accident. He was flying from Miami out to uh, his home in Virginia, and his gear would not let down, and he landed belly up with a full load of fuel in a drum tank. Mm. And I talked to his widow later on, and she said, I have never been so terrified in my life. I said, here's that plane scooting down with this bolt plane behind it, and Gail jumped out of it ran over, got himself covered with spray gas, or spray gas and spray water. And uh, anyway, so that was the, almost the worst day of my life. So anyway, the plane was totally destroyed. Now there is Oshkosh 91. By then, an enterprising guy back in California was building a replica of a, an F-8. And I got this from Jeff Ethel. How many of you have read any of Jeff Ethel's books on color photography? That's too bad because one black and white, I mean the war, World War II was a black and white war. <coughs> color film was almost unavailable to the news photographers. It was very expensive and difficult to process. So most of the genuine pictures from World War II are black and white. The few black and whites were colorized after the war, but genuine pictures were not colored. However, Jeff Ethel, who became a great aviator and a Princeton minister, wrote an article that my sister picked up. And in this article, he said, World War II was a black and white war, but I found in my brother's and my father's effects a few colored slides. And I got thinking, if my dad, who was an ace in, in North Africa, could take color pictures. There must be other people who did that. So he says, if anybody has color pictures, please send them to me. I sent him a letter. I said, I have over 500 color pictures. He said, will you loan them to me? So I loaned them to him, and probably half of those have been published in books by Jeff Ethel. So if you ever get a, chance, get a chance to see them, those were all pictures that were contributed by guys who, during World War II, took color pictures of everything going on. Jeff Ethel, I suggest his name. Okay, now, in West, in West, in uh, Oshkosh 91, they had a special Al Williams Day. Now, Al had passed on by this time, but EAA decided to honor Al Williams by having a special day for him. I got a hold of the guy out at the Plains of Fame Museum 
who had built this replica, a, a two-seat replica, now of the Gulfa II, of the Gulfa IV, and uh, got him to agree to fly the airplane back there. I was asked to give the keynote speech. So if you, some of you, I'm sure some of you have been to Oshkosh, you've been out to the Theater of the Woods. I spoke out there. I also invited Mrs. L. Williams, whom I'd gotten to know. So she came out with her daughter, who was a noted uh, voice instructor, with her granddaughter, who was an opera singer, and Mrs. Williams. This was his second wife. So we were entertained by the owner now of this Gilbock Fourth, and from Oshkosh, he was going to fly it out to California to put on an air demonstration, and he said, would you like to fly with me? I said, this is a full Catholic. So here I am sitting in the back seat of that Gulf Hawk II replica. Now it's the Gulf Hawk IV. We were escorted by a Mustang and a Corsair, and uh, naturally we beat the Mustang and the Corsair, but I chartered this painting by a fellow who's now passed on. He's a noted artist up in, uh, what's this place up the road? Must little town. Prescott? What? Prescott, Sedona? Yeah. No, no, just before Sedona. Well, anyway. The Locky Pocky? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> so anyway, we flew over to uh, Falcon. Who did I have breakfast with this morning? <laughs> uh, we flew over to California, where the Plains of Fame Museum is. Landed the airplane there, and a uh, boy, here I was with a kid who was sat, sat in the bell block too, and went with the controls. Yeah. What hell would was alive? But I can't believe it. Anyway, that's the painting they put it on there. And the metal one, one on there is one that they all put on a picture that I had. And it says something like, when it becomes dark and dreary down below, let's go on top and stay there. Mentally, at least. So I have that personally signed by him, one of my other pictures. Looks like okay. Now, going on to the flying school days, from ROTC in college, uh, I was commissioned to the Corps of Engineers. So I went down to Fort Belvoir, learning how to spread uh, wire, barbed wire, and build floating bridges. Pontons. I found out they were spelled pontoon, but they were pronounced pontoon. And uh, I tried to get in the airport. I said, hell no, you're going to be part of the main force invading England. So they turned me down until I saw a memo that General Hap Arnold put out. Major General Henry Archard, Henry Arnold, Chief of the U.S. Air Corps, has said any company grade officer in the, in the Army who wants to learn flying as a student officer Pilot, navigator, bombardier, will fly to my office. Do not go through channels. <laughs> Boy, that, that was the word I needed. Yeah. So after three years as, a, as an engineer building bridges, I was now going to be in a position to bomb bridges. So anyway, there, okay, that, the airplane that I got into after flying school was a B-25. Actually, it was really called an F-10, F for photo. And now that's one of the few students few privileges that student officers got. So we went through the, the whole went through the whole training school with the cadets. Uh, flew with them, flew the same instructors they did, but here and there we got a few little preferences. One of them was to express your desire for their next assignment. And I said, I want to fly P thirty eights. I want to go to Elliot Roosevelt's outfit flying P thirty eights. So they said, Congratulations. You almost got the P thirty eight. You got a B twenty five. Holy appeals. So ultimately I wound up with this airplane, now called an F-10. And uh, that was the crew that we flew with. I flew as the, as the co-pilot. And that was the airplane at Buckley Field, Denver, Colorado. And I just invite your attention to the tail number in yellow, 43-3374. That was my call sign. Army 3374. And it was this camouflage in protective colors. The first thing they did when I got down to Tolera, Peru, that was an oddball to them. Here I, here I am in a brand new squadron. I'm the very senior first lieutenant at a zero flying time for B-25s. So anyway, the first thing they did was strip the paint off. They said, hey, we're flying over jungle, <coughs> ice land, everything under the sun, and we won't stick out if we crash. 
that we're going to strip the paint off and you're going to be skin, aluminum skin color. And that's what it was with their on. Now, Frank has done a great job of taking a map of South America and marking it up to show the area that we did most of our I was sent to Tulare, Peru. Was it, and I was the odd, odd, all of the squad. Senior first lieutenant, no flying time. So we were sent to Tulare, Peru. That's on the extreme western edge of Panama. We were then moved down to Chile. We moved down to San Diego, Chile. And we moved over to the east coast. So we pretty much covered the continent, mapping the country, uh, taking the low level pictures of some of the ports either the Japanese or the Germans could be using for embarkation or loading out spies. Now, when we flew in Chile, we had to, well, first of all, we were treated beautifully there. They thought we were real heroes. But we had to have a Chilean officer fly with us. And I drew a cavalry officer by the name of Roberto Imanis. The first time we flew, he showed up with his cavalry boots and spurs, saber. I said, Captain, sorry. But you've got to wear flying boots or you'll freeze. You've got to take those spurs off and no sabers aboard. If I'm killed without my flying boots on, I'll be a disgrace to my family. I said, well, fly with your boots on, but I'm going to take some flying boots along in case you need them. He needed them from now on. Jimenez was my guy. Somebody else had a, cap a Navy captain, and somebody else had another Army captain. But it was, a, it was an interesting thing. Okay, there's my airplane. Now, that insignia may be familiar to some of you. That was the 91st photo squadron, which existed as the 91st photo squadron in World War I. And the later commander of that squadron was George Kenny. Now, Kenny, in the picture that I have, there's the whole squadron lined up in front of the Samson A2A. None of them left, they're all gone. They were French airplanes. But uh, they had a big flag up on Armistice Day with this insignia. And that insignia is Saint Somebody. Good Catholic could tell me his name. Anyway, he's a saint of the Catholic Church. Saint chasing, Michael. Pardon? Saint Michael, probably. I think that's right. Saint Michael. He's chasing <coughs> Satan out of England. And that became the insignia of that squadron, which exists today and it's on my jacket. Pardon me for wearing my jacket, but somebody else showed up there with a jacket, and I decided I wasn't going to be, he wasn't going to be the only guy with, with the medals on his jacket. So anyway, I have this insignia, it's the name on the airplane. Now when I finally got to the captain of the airplane, I was given the right of putting a name on it. My best friend down there flew the same type of airplane called My Aiken Ass. And I thought, boy, here I am, what it must be five and six. I'm going to call my, my happy ass. So that's, that's what that name is. That's what the insignia still exists. The squadron is now known as the 91st Sabre Squadron. No airplanes, but lots of brains and computers. Okay, now they, they wanted to, okay, I guess they wanted to picture me with my 40 mission hat. Well, there's the picture of the nose. Now we have that this was a photo plane. We didn't carry guns, we didn't carry bombs, but we had a photo nose and we had three great big K-17 cameras. One of them shot vertically, two shot out on the oblique. And you can see them right there, the two oblique cameras in the, uh, on either side and then the vertical in the middle. Now here's a picture of, of the other plane. This is my Aiken ass. It couldn't be my happy ass. Now there's a picture that I might very well have, it might very well have been taken from my airplane. But it's a volcano in Chile, uh, about halfway down to San Diego, on the date, which I can't read now with my glasses, August 1944. I was flying at that time, so my airplane very well could have taken this picture. I would have just been the driver, but my photographer would have snapped the crap the, the channels. Explain the direction you're looking. Oh yeah, on this picture, we're flying from bottom to north. So the north is up, right is the Pacific Ocean, left is inland. So the big peak on the left there is the mountain itself. And then the, uh, and then right down there, there's the escape hole, there's where the lava is coming from, and flowing down toward the Pacific. 
I flew over that place several years ago when I was on tour down there. Still look the same. Okay, now this this was a a, a a real genuine anniversary couch bed in Chile. We were there on Desio Chile, the 18th of the month, and I bought this serape and the hat, which I've considered to be my favorite souvenir from my combat tour in South America. <laughs> but in helping me pack the move, my daughter said, oh, that's an old costume. She gave it away. I said, daughter, don't ever throw away anything of mine. Every scrap of paper in this collection is important. Don't throw away anything. Uh, I'll let you tell about that picture. I'm flying with my co-pilot there, who was a master sergeant, uh, in the cockpit, in the co-pilot seat. Not, not usually do you let your listen and fly with you, but uh, I was on a particular mission where I didn't have a co-pilot and Shorty killed him over there. Then we transitioned into B-17s, which were known, we were F-10s, the B-17 I think was an F-7, B-24 was an F-9, and went all the way up to Howard Hughes airplane, it was the F-12 I think, the twin engine plane. The F-13 was a rainbow. But anyway, it was still because it started out with an F-2, which was a beach, a twin beach. So I flew that on many missions also. Now, in the course of our transitioning to the B-17s, we were going to be expanding our network of bases, and we had to fly over to Paraguay and to Rio de Janeiro, Rio de Janeiro, Rio de Janeiro, to work out the arrangements. And uh, in the course of it, coming into Rio, here was one of the pictures that we took from my plane. And uh, you can see the, the statue of Christ on top of the, the hill. I forget the name of the hill you've been there, Greg. Yeah, it's, uh, it's the Christ of the Andes. Yeah, right there. And that's Sugarloaf. That's Sugar. for those of you who've been there. And Santos Dumont Airport was right over there, which is a pretty exciting place to fly in and out of, even if you're a passenger on an airline. <laughs> Short runway with water on both ends. Okay, go ahead. Well, let me start back here. Okay, this is a very famous B-17. It was its name was called the Swoos, named after a song called Alexander Swoos. Now Alexander was the child of a nasty goose and a lovely swan. Now. Most of our B-17s were destroyed on December 7th. Uh, the Swoos was located at Hickam Field in Blythe. It flew to Hawaii to uh, Clark Field, flew to Clark Field, where more of them were destroyed. But the Swoos was in the air on the day of the Japanese attack. The war went on. It was also flying a mission on the day the Japanese surrendered. It's now in the Air Force Museum as one of the most famous planes in their collection. It's being restored now, but it, it was stationed at Oakbrook Field. And the reason for that was it was a, a very severe problem going on between Argentina and Chile. Now Argentina was supposed to be neutral at that time, but they were threatening problems with, uh, with Chile. So they sent General Pratt down to Chile with the B-17, the Swiss, and the flight of B-24s. Okay. How many doing on time? We're going to need to speed it up a little. Over okay. Here. okay. Um, we'll speed it up. Uh, continue about about the Swiss and your and your photo. Okay. Okay. Well, that photo is autographed by Jack Crane who was trained by the Navy pilots in the old flying boat days. And Jack Crane is there in that picture, and Lieutenant General Brett was there. Now, Brett had been the MacArthur's chief of the Air Service, but he didn't get along very well with MacArthur or with his deputy. So that's when George Kenny was brought in as the chief of the Pacific Air Forces. And General Brett was sent off to Panama as the chief of the 6th Air Force to carry a defense command. Okay, let's pass on to. Let's, uh, let's go to. Okay. Okay. <coughs> 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 
pictures here are actually from the official Doolittle collection of his inventory of great pictures. <coughs> Among the nice things that it shows are those uh, 16 B-25s that were on the carrier, how uh, they were stacked in there nose to tail. So you can imagine that Doolittle took off number one, he had a short run, relatively short on the carrier. But the guys on the back end had a long drag before they could ready to take off. And some of my collection, I have the official pictures of that flight, and uh, that's, that's worth watching sometime, but not tonight. Okay, there again is my plane at Boulder, at, Dup, at Boulder, Colorado, Denver, Colorado, uh, in its colors. And I just call your attention to the exhaust tanks, because it's important. They, remember that was a nine-cylinder right engine. <coughs> that's, that's only later on in the airplane. That's in the airplane in the uh, Okay. We can go on from there. Okay. That's the tail number is 374. Okay, now there's the same airplane in the Air Force Museum. It's uh, painted dark brown, and I was assuming a Jimmy Doolittle, a Jimmy Doolittle position. The reason for that is that the pilot of one of the planes on the Doolittle raid went to General May, the chief of staff of the Air Force, and he said, in effect, General, the building of an Air Force Academy, of an Air Force Museum, has been approved. It hasn't been yet built. We must have a B-25 in the Air Force Museum as an honor to the Doodle Raiders. But they're out of service. They're all being cut up. What's left of them are out at the Davis Monthan Air Force Base is junk. <coughs> and he said, we've got to have one. Jack Sims, who was the pilot of number six airplane, amazed that we'll go ahead and get one. So he worked with North Americans who built the B-25s to build, to take a B-25 from the Air Force inventory, restore it to the configuration of Doolittle's plane at no cost to the government. This was done. It was presented to the Doolittle Raiders at one of their annual conventions in Las Vegas. Um, it was flown there by uh, Jack Sims, that was the one that recommended that to uh, General May that they do that, and uh, they almost completed the restoration. It was almost identical to Doolittle's plane, including Doolittle's tail numbers on the airplane. We removed the cameras that we have in ours. They changed the compass. The only thing they didn't do was change the exhaust stacks. Because as you saw in my airplane, there were individual exhaust stacks for those nine cylinders. On the plane that North America restored, they did not change the, the, the configuration of the, of the exhaust stacks. But they took the loose hardware and put it loose in the airplane and sent it to the Air Force Museum. Now, somehow or other, God bless me, heaven forbid, Heaven forgive me, the Air Force Museum lost those exhaust stacks. <laughs> so the way the airplane is displayed now, the engines are covered with tarpaulins. So that they look like they looked on the carrier Hornet. Or was it the Wasp? Hornet. 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 Yeah. Hornet. Yeah. Because they looked on the deck of the Hornet, they had tarpaulins over the edges. That's the way it looks now. So only the director of the museum and a few of the Raiders knife know that the one that's there is not quite accurate. However, if you look inside the airplane on the structure, there's a manufacturer's nameplate that shows my serial number. So that might eliminate the argument. Microphone. Uh, okay, here's a picture of Dick Cole. Dick Cole is the last survivor of the Doolittle Raid. Uh, they have had many renewal, many uh, repeats at their annual meeting. I've attended 10 or 20 of them, and I've gotten to know most of the Raiders, but Dick Cole is the last one. He's the 103, I think. <coughs> okay, now the one of the Raiders, the, first of all, the Raiders were all told that okay, this is a very dangerous mission. If there's anybody who doesn't want to go on it, you can bow out now. It will not be held against you. Now, there's been some talk about maybe trying to land in Russia because it's less distance to fly from Japan than China is. 
who said, absolutely, you are not to go to Russia. You're going to go to China, to the predetermined base. Things didn't work out well. The plan, the uh, aids that were looking set up in China did not show. And most of the planes, this plane ran out of fuel. Some of them bailed out over China. Some of them bailed out in the water before they got to China. One of them encountered excessive fuel consumption. So he took off for Australia, or for, for uh, Russia. Uh, they all bombed their, their targets in Japan, but uh, Ski York announced that his, he was having excessive fuel consumption. There was no way he could reach China. So despite the warning, he was told that he had to go. Now this was a nameplate, this was a plate that the Doolittle Raiders had on their last meal before they launched the raid. They all signed it down in the middle of that uh, compass is General Doolittle signature, all the rest outside. One strange thing. Up in the upper right hand corner, you'll see Ski York. That's exactly where he flew because he had excessive fuel consumption. Now, let's go on to another picture. Uh, we're, we're 21. Uh, one of men, Tom Ribbon. You and. It's just after. Just after the one of men. Right there. It's right there. Yeah. Now there's a Rece there's a reception down in San Antonio. It was actually held out at Fort Sam Houston. There's a General Doug Jones, or Dave Jones, in the white hat. The guy in the black hat, holding his hands up, is Tom Griffin. Tom was the navigator on the plane. He was the chief navigator for the mission. So I was talking to Tom one night with that map in front of me, and I said, Tom, you were the chief navigator. Yeah. You passed out the maps to everybody, yeah. In Ski York's airplane, they found street maps of Russia. <laughs> what are you trying to tell me? I said, I'm not telling you anything, Joe, uh, this Tom. I'm just wondering, did Ski York actually have maps of Russia, or was he just putting that on the sheet, on the sheet so that if he was lost in action, people would know where he was headed? I said, what do you think? I said, I'm not gonna tell you what I think. I said, let's keep it that way. <laughs> so I don't know. It's a supposition on my part. But anyway, he's wearing a Missouri hat for the Cardinals. He was bald-headed. He was a Cincinnati Reds fan. And he was sitting there cooking on that Texas sun. So I handed him my, my Arizona Diamondback hat. Yeah. And he put it on. That's why he's giving me the OK sign. <laughs> Now there is the airplane in the Air Force Museum. That is my airplane. The endorsement on it is signed by General Metcalf, who was the director of the museum at that time, and says, oh, we're taking good care of your airplane. And it's signed by Dick Paul, and I can't read all the rest of the signatures there, uh, but there's like there are five or six other signatures on there. Uh, Dick Cole has a copy of that picture. I know his daughter very well, and I talk to him every few days, and he has that picture mounted down there in his own. So, let's see, let's see what the next one is. That's, 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 that's it. That's it. That's the last photo. Okay. I tried to keep it within 20 minutes. I don't know whether I did or not. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty close. Pretty close. So I apologize, I apologize for going over. over. <laughs> Do you have a question there, Andrew? If I don't if you in the line, so please tell me. To be continued. Can you any of the slides that went through real fast? Can Pardon? You, can you touch on any of those previous slides? It might be interesting. Sure. Uh, real fast? Then let's see. Uh, we need to wrap it up. Let's do that. Let's do that. If anybody wants to stay, we can go for that. Yeah, there's another one that I wanted to talk about. I'll tell you just very briefly. Does anybody remember Jimmy Maggard? Jimmy Maggard was an early Arctic flyer. Chuck Yeager's. Okay. 
Um, well, Jimmy Manor was one of the very early aviators in the country. He was a QB, he was a Dedanian, and uh, he started flying back in the early days of World War I movies. I'm sure some of you have seen the movie Hell's Angels, produced by Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes decided he didn't like one of the scenes, that he would fly the airplane. So he crashed and was burning, and Jimmy Matter rescued him. And years later, I went to a meeting of this American Aviation Historical Society, and Jimmy Matter's widow was the speaker. And I took the picture that I had of Jimmy Matter, and she was tickled to death with it. So she and I became good friends. <coughs> Later on, she called me up and said that she was moving permanently to California. Would I come down and help her decide what to do with Jimmy's stuff? So I went down to her apartment in Sun City with my son. And I said, Dorothy, did I misunderstand you? You're leaving for good tomorrow? She said, yes. I said, Dorothy, you've got stuff for a museum. This is junk. So anyway, to make a long story short, I took a pile of junk to my house, which she said, that total junk, so you do what you want to do with it. The rest of it, you can put in museums if you want to. So half of it we put into the uh, Texas Museum, the other half we put into the Oklahoma Aviation Hall of Fame. Why? Because Jimmy Matter got a call from Will Rogers. Said, hey, let's go fishing in Alaska. You have the airplane, I'll pay for the gas. So he said, look, I've got a radio show, uh, book sales, why don't you call Wiley Post? Oh, boy. Well, I'm sure everybody knows the relationship between Wiley Post and Jimmy and uh, Wiley Post and, and Will Rogers. Will Rogers. Yeah. And in here, this is, I don't have the pictures here, but I have the picture collection from Jimmy Matter. One of the things that Dorothy gave me, didn't give me, but asked me to take care of, was Jimmy Matter's whole collection of stuff. <laughs> Beautiful pictures. Many pictures taken from his camera, or from Will Rogers' camera, to show Will Rogers and Wiley Post on their last flight. And as you remember, they, took, they got lost in Alaska, they landed for help, they left Will, Will Rogers left in the airplane with the engine running, Wiley Post went in got a map, came back on the airplane, still running, took off, went into these usually spectacular takeoff, the ice had formed when they were sitting there, the plane stalled, the old crash and killed both of them. So, uh, anyway, that was, that was quite a story. Um.